Hello, everyone, and welcome to Angular London Online. I think we can still uh, safely say Happy New Year. So, Happy New Year, seeing as we haven't seen everyone, well, at least face to face for a while. So, I think that's a good excuse. Um, just before we get started, I just wanted to uh, cover a few things. So, firstly, if you have a talk you think would be good, please get in touch. We'd love to um, have you on here. Um, during the talk, don't forget you can put in your comments below any Q and A, um, and we'll do a little Q and A session at the end with Dave. And finally, once we're finished here, we'll be going to Zoom straight after. Put the details up here, but I'll put them up again at the end of the um, this stream. We'll post them um, into the uh, comments, I guess, as well. And I'll put it in the comments as well, definitely. Um, so I'm going to now hand over to Pete to uh, intro our talk today. So we're very lucky to have a, a fantastic developer and open source contributor and generally all round top bloke. Um, we're going to be uh, having a bit of a chat afterwards and I'm not gonna spend too long uh, introducing Dave, but um, I just wanted to say uh, when he came to Angular Connect uh, just over a year ago now, um, there was a very cute moment where he brought his newborn child on stage and they had a little selfie and uh, uh, it was a really nice moment and um, we just saw the little toddler that's now uh, what a year and a half old yeah and yeah it's about 18 months yeah and she's doing great so um, we're hoping the next time you come and give us a live talk you can you can bring uh, her along again maybe she'll have something <laughs> to say yeah she probably will <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I think you're going to do your own kind of introduction, so I'll let you just get on with the slides, if that's all right. And uh, we'll speak yeah. to you afterwards. Thank you very yeah, much sure. for coming. You need to share your screen again, Dave. It seems to have disappeared. Cool. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> how's, how's this looking? Let's have a go. That looks good. Cool. Very much. OK. Awesome. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's very cool to be doing this. Uh, it was a very nice intro, um, but yeah. Hi, this is, uh, this is my talk. You don't need that API yet. Um, we'll dig into what that exactly means as, as we go on. Um, but yeah, hi, um, I'm Dave. Uh, I live in the middle of nowhere in Somerset now. Um, decided to re relocate into avoiding uh, global pandemic diseases. Uh, I'm a software engineer over, over energy. Um, probably have to add in the obligatory where we're hiring at the moment. So feel free to reach out um, if you, if you want to see what it's like working here. Uh, I'm not particularly great, good at creating pretty slides. You're about to learn this if you haven't seen uh, any of my talks before. Uh, and if you ever want to get in touch with me, please hit me up Twitter, uh, Dave Writes Codes, um, or hit me up by email there. Um, I love to chat about things. So you know, if you want to hit me up about anything, I'm, I'm always around. Um, but yeah, jumping into it, uh, things we're going to talk about are some of the more, start off with some of the more obvious things. Uh, you know, around front-end development, uh, the things we do and don't like doing when writing front-end code and the classic way that we're used to doing um, product development work in, in companies and in, in projects. Um, some of the pain points along with that and sort of some of the things that we can improve about that. And uh, we'll, we'll throw in a bunch of uh, live coding in there as well to, to save you falling asleep. Um, but anyway, uh, I guess also on top of that, you know, just a quick what this is and isn't. Um, these are just a bunch of my opinions, which you might disagree with, which is really, really cool. Like, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, these are just some ways uh, that I think that people can sort of uh, develop software in a slightly different way, which allows them to move a bit faster. Um, you already might be doing all of the things that I'm talking about, but I, I implore you to, to, to listen anyway. There might be some little nuggets of, of, of interest that you can you can take away from this. Um, and this definitely isn't like, you know, a coding masterclass where I show you the only way to do something or tell you it's the only way to do something. But anyway, um, let's just keep keep pressing on. Um, so yeah, some of the, the more obvious things here, the things that we like to do when writing front-end code is writing front-end code, um, you know, uh, being able to sort of keep focus without having to, to context switch a lot. And getting code into production, you know, that's a nice feeling. We, do, we don't like it when things don't go into production. Um, yeah, these things make us really happy and it's fantastic. Um, 
On the other side of things, uh, things we don't like to do when writing front end code is not writing front end code and context switching. So, you know, if it's just a small front end change, you know, just update the front end with the new API response or, or whatever, we don't want to have to, you know, jump into other systems. Maybe you're relying on a back end engineer to write an endpoint for you and a DB person to create some DB tables, maybe an infrastructure person to do some infra stuff. You know, all of this stuff lends itself to code taking longer um, to getting into production. Uh, and we sort of try to avoid that when we can because, you know, it's a nice feeling to, to be able to do that. And, yeah, these things make us sad. Um, and, yeah, that's that's really trivializing things, um, obviously. And and this, this slide is also really trivializing things. Um, you know, this probably describes what quite a lot of you do um, in your organization. Um, and you know, my myself included. You know, some someone has an idea, and that idea makes it onto a backlog of other ideas. It gets prioritized. Uh, the you know, front end person will pick up the front end code uh, side of things. Back end person will pick up the back end code. Um, maybe a full stack engineer picks up both of those things. You know, it's hard to say, but it's you know, it's it's not uncommon. Um, maybe some amount of testing occurs. I'm not going to go into the testing side of things in this talk. You know, that's a that's a whole other can of worms there. Um, so, you know, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. Um, some amount of time elapses, could be a minute, could be a year, who knows, depends where you work. Um, and then code gets into production. Um, and I'll say this uh, now, and I'll probably say it about 50 more times uh, during the rest of this talk, but um, this, there is nothing wrong with this. You know, this works. Um, so I'm, I'm most certainly not saying that there is anything bad about this. I just think that there can be some slight improvements. Um, and this is obviously very high level and we're about to drill down into a little bit more specific side of things. Um, and I just realized today when I was going through my slides, I, I said that there was nothing wrong with that. And then I've gone and titled this slide, what is wrong with that? <laughs> really, it should just be, what are some of Dave's observations about that? Um, and just to quickly go through some of them, you know, if you do have front end specialists and back end specialists in your team, you know, you might be creating bo blockers for your front end people. If they're ready and keen to pick up some work, but there's no API endpoint that exists or something needs to be modified or whatever, you know, you can create a bit of lag there. You can blow out lead time there. So that's a, that, that's one potential pain point. And then if you need, you know, to set up your front end system to work on your, your local development machine, and then also, you know, an API server and who, who knows what else, you know, you might need to get some DBs up and running or connecting to like a staging or prod environment, you know, that's that's all stuff that can can you know add to frustrations or sort of, you know, if it's not quite in your 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 sort of like skill set, it might be quite daunting. Um, obviously if you're connecting out to a production environment for your local development, um, you can probably just get an Uber and and, and hop over to develop a jail because you probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, but yeah, and as I mentioned just earlier before, all these problems exist if you're a full stack dev as well. Um, the, 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 the context switching between those things is also, you know, some people think that they're really good at context switching, but in reality, I think that we know that, you know, it, it it's a lot of overhead. It's, it is a bit of a pain. Um, yeah. Um, what would a better world, uh, look like? There's only a couple of things. Um, but this is some of the things that we're going to focus on here. Um, so getting code into production faster, you know, re regardless of what your setup's like in your organization or in your projects, it's always nice to be able to have a, have a nice pipeline so that, you know, things can be integrated easily and, and frequently. Um, and then some more obvious ones as well, just creating less blockers for yourself and, and creating less context switching moments or opportunities uh, for yourself. And I think, you know, everyone, everyone watching this can probably agree with that pretty easily. Um, and so I've said a lot of things. I've probably burnt up about 10 minutes um, talking about this sort of stuff. And so let's actually see what the what this could look like in a, in a project. And so um, fortunately, I've got a project uh, that we're going to have a look at. Uh, and we're going to see what the dev process looks like it um, in roughly the first way that I described. And then we'll just do something simple. We'll just add, a, we'll add an API mocking layer to it. And we'll just see what happens when we remove the hard dependency for an API in our project and what that looks like with our feature development work. And so we're going to have a look at that and, and, and talk about that a little bit. Um, so I'll also apologize when this for in advance for how when this uh, live coding sort of uh, goes, goes wrong. 
Um, please shout out. I'll just open up the comments. Just please uh, shout out if um, the, the my font is too small or anything, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the comments. Um, what we'll do is I've just got a, a project that is just been I got a an Angular application um, for the front end, and I've just got a little node service um, for the back end. Um, so the back end's all spun up, and the front end's all spun up. So if I go into my browser now. So what we've got here, um, it looks very contrived, and it is, but we've got a little widget factory. Um, and so uh, we are connecting out to our, end, uh, our back end to go and get these widgets, um, which are represented by these numbers, which are their IDs. Um, and it's, you know, this looks very contrived, but this is basically every single CRUD application ever. You know, we're connecting to an API, and we're displaying some data that's coming in from an API. And so we can have a quick look at what some of the code for this looks like. Um, our server side is very, very easy to sort of wrap our heads around. Uh, I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Um, so our server side, you know, we've got one endpoint called widgets, uh, and it's returning an array of uh, widgets, just all, all that's attached to them is an ID. Uh, and that's where we get our, our 10 widgets here. Um, you know, there's not much else to say about the back end. Uh, it's quite easy to wrap your head around. Obviously, in the real world, there'd be a little bit more complicated stuff going on here with databases and probably authentication. But anyway, um, and then over on the front end side, um, we've just got one component. You can ignore the commented code for now. Um, it's it's not important until we move on to the next bit. Um, but basically, on initialization, we call that widgets endpoint, and then we update our, our, our local state to to reflect what's coming from the API there. Um, and then on the template side, not that this is particularly interesting just yet, um, but we're just we're just displaying that. Um, you'll notice that there is a little thing here uh, to do with widget IDs being above 100 and not supported. Um, just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll we'll come back to that in a little bit, um, and we we can see what ramifications this could have um, in our project work. Um, but anyway. What's now happened is we've got a new thing that we want to add to our uh, application, and we want to add a button that allows us to create a new widget. Uh, and ideally, you know, it would follow some sort of ID uh, incremental process or, or, or whatever, so that you know we're getting a new widget ID every time we create a new one. And so we're going to look at what this development process looks like. So um, maybe we tackle the back end first. Maybe we tackle the front end first. Um, We'll, we'll start off with the back end side of things just really quickly, um, just because it's quite a quick one. Um, and it's quite it's quite easy to follow. Um, so we'll add a new uh, node endpoint here. And um, we'll say app.get. Uh, and we'll say slash new widget. Uh, we've got a request and response object. Uh, and we'll return. Uh, what will we return here? I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll simulate a, a database kind of thing here. Um, so we'll say we'll create a variable called uh, last widget ID, and we'll set that to ten just because we know that the latest when we initialize things our, our last widget ID is ten. Um, and in our response object here, we'll say that the ID is plus plus last widget ID. And we'll restart our server, and then hopefully. Uh, we can now go and do some front-end development. So I've just made this uh, a little bit easier on ourselves uh, just because I, I can. Um, so we've got uh, this this function to, to call the endpoint that we've just created, um, very similar to the first one. So we won't really go through that. The only difference really is that, um, that we're calling the new widget endpoint. Um, and so we'll save that. And then in our, our template, we've just got a button there. Um, so that actually when we click it, we, we call the add new widget function. And that's basically it. So now when we go into our, our front end here, we can see that we've got a generate new widget button. Uh, and when we hit it, you can see that we've now got a new widget with the ID of 11. Hit it again a couple more times. You know, we're up to 15 now. And you know, because the, we're sort of pretending to have a database on the back end as well, you know, we can reload the page and it follows on from, from the last ID that was used. Um, so that's a really, really basic example of of adding a feature to our to our project, um, and obviously the backend um, part of this looked really easy to do because we were literally just returning an object and incrementing an ID. Um, in the real world, it's not going to be quite that easy. Obviously, you know this is going to be a database connection. Um, 
you know, there's going to probably be some authentication on here. You probably, you know, if it's a large scale or, a, you know, so a high scale application, you might need to optimize for, for IO and, and, you know, optimize the, the endpoint to, to whatever degree. So it's, it's not quite this trivial in real life, but this is sort of the easiest way to be able to imagine it um, without sending everyone to, to sleep. <laughs> but anyway, and then on the front end, you know, we're a bit more comfortable in the front end world. We can make a call out to an endpoint and display the data and, you know, make it pretty and, and all of that. You know, that's really easy for us to do. Um, and so that, you know, this was easy. Um, if we were relying on a backend engineer to do this work, that creates time. You know, if we weren't able to carry out this work ourselves, um, if, you know, there could be all sorts of numbers of things that sort of slowed down this this project, uh, this um, this feature work. Um, so it's sort of like, it, it's something to keep in mind. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look out, look at what happens when we get rid of this widget server. Um, so we've just killed this process. That's it, that's the backend gone. Um, so we'll get rid of that. We'll say goodbye to that. And we're going to add uh, an API mocking layer into the front end, front end of our application. Um, so just before this talk, um, I added into the project dependencies. Um, I added, uh, where is it? I added data mocks into there. I was just doing the npm add data mocks. Um, just wanted to make sure that, you know, if npm was down for this demo, that we weren't going to run into problems. Um, but that's really the only thing that I've done, I think. Um, and we're going to go on to the entry point of our application. We've all seen a file like this before in our Angular apps. The only difference is that I've said, uh, if we're not in production mode, we're going to call a function called uh, init marks. Um, and that's just in the root of the project. Uh, and we'll go into that file and it's just a, it's just an empty function. So this is where we're going to, this is where we're going to integrate our API mocking layer. And so I'm using data mocks, um, as I think I've mentioned before, there's loads and loads of other libraries to do this and most of them are a lot better than this, but this is just one way of doing it. So we can import a few functions from data mocks. So we can import inject mocks, um, which is the thing that injects things into the application. Um, we can uh, import a type called scenarios, which will just help us with typing our, uh, our, our mocks and a little utility function called extract scenario from location uh, and we'll import that there uh, and then we can get going with uh, our, our function here so we can we can create a variable called scenarios and it will be typed as scenarios and all this is is an object mapping of scenarios and all a scenario is is a set of API responses that our application has so a default um, set of scenarios um, so we've got oh, let's just close that uh, we've got two endpoints um, that are being called in this application. We've got slash widgets and slash new widget. So we'll create a mock response for both of those. Um, so for the first one, um, we only need three things to describe a mock. Um, this is very, very easy. The first thing is the URL. Uh, it can be a regular expression or a string. Um, in this case, I'll just use a regex, because uh, why not? Um, so we've got widgets, uh, which is the describe the URL. Um, the HTTP method that it is, so get, uh, and the response object that we want. Um, now, I've got to see how good my memory is here. I think if we want to replicate what we had before, we can spread on an array, 10 objects, and then we can map over them. And we don't need the first argument, we need the second one. Uh, and then we can return an object that has the ID, which is ID plus one. I think that gets the job done, maybe not, oh, index plus one, whoops. I think that gets the job done for that. Um, just a nice way of doing that. And then the second endpoint that we need to uh, mock out is the new widgets endpoint. And so we can do this um, and say it's for new widgets. So we can say the method is uh, get again, response object. Uh, just for simplicity's sake, we'll just make this a random number. Um, so we'll just say math dot for math dot random uh, uh, times one hundred plus one, something like that. Uh, that that gives us a rand random enough number. Um, and so we've created our set of you know mocks. We've got two endpoints, two responses. That's great. Um, now we need to inject this into our application, and how we can do that is by calling inject mocks and we'll pass in our scenarios through to it. 
Um, we do have one unused import here, which we are going to go back to and have a look at in a minute, uh, but we can ignore that for now. And now that we've injected uh, our mocks into our application, we should be able to go into our app here. Um, and as you can see, whoops, as you can see, we've got exactly what we had before, but if we open the dev tools and all of that, we can see we're not actually calling out to our widgets endpoints or anything. It's all being done locally with our, with our mock API layer. And that's really, really nice. Um, and we can also, you know, hit the, oh, I've made a mistake. Let's find out what the mistake is. Uh, okay, response is ID or, oh, this is gonna be fun. Uh, let's just really quickly make that. See what happens. Oh, new widget, that's that's it. See it? Oh, so we just, yeah, we oh, that came back. I was a bit unlucky that if a random number between one and a hundred, we've got one with the same ID, but you know, we can, we, we can we can generate you know random widgets at this point, and we can get really fancy with that to to replicate the behavior that we had before. But I just thought I'd keep it simple. Um, but the beauty of this is that now you know anytime we need to add uh, a, a new endpoint to our application, all we need to do is add a new mock entry here, and we get that. We don't need to rely on an API endpoint existing yet, and we'll we'll sort of delve into the other advantages of that in a minute. But what we will look at is going back to uh, this little guy here of the widgets IDs above 100 aren't supported. So this is an interesting one because if we had an actual endpoint um, with, our, with our application, we were connecting to an actual API server. The problem here is that how do we, how do we reliably in our development mode you know, test this sort of edge case here um, and making sure that, you know, this application behaves properly when we do get an ID that is greater than 100 um, supported. And so uh, obviously, you know, we could go into a database table and modify something for ourselves, um, but that's not really great because if it's shared data, then you might mess up someone else's uh, dev experiences and they might be trying to test something at the same time as you. And, you know, you can sort of follow that train of thought. So um, what we can do with these, these mock APIs, and this is, a, you know, Datamox isn't the only one that does this sort of stuff, but we can we can add an extra scenario here. Um, so let's just call this really big widget. Um, that sounds like a band or something that I'd go and see. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, um, what we can do with uh, defining extra scenarios, I think this is just, uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, what we can do is we get everything from our default set of um, API responses, but we can also override whatever we want as well in our extra scenario. So what we can do is we can say that we want to override the new widget uh, endpoint, and we can say that you know the methods is still a get, uh, and the response uh, this time, let's say this is a really big widget. Let's just say that we get back an ID of uh, 1001. Uh, and that's that's really big, and we know that's not support, and we need to see how our app behaves with that. Um, so anyway, the last thing left to do is to tell you know inject mocks which scenario to use. So we could just pass through the string really big widget, and that would load it up for us. Um, but we actually have a, a our little helper function here, um, and all this does is if you pass the uh, location object through to it. Um, we can actually toggle which scenario we want via the URL in our browser, and that's a much nicer experience for us. So what we can do is we can see that you know by default we have our, our, our um, base set of you know our base set of responses. Um, we generate you know a random widget, and you know that's all good. And then we can also come in here. We can say you know what if the scenario is really big widget? Well, you can see that we've got a, a base set of um, uh, widgets here, and then if we hit create new widget, you know we've now got this. Really big, ugly, unsupported, unstyled, uncated for thing, um, and you know we can obviously in the real world this this sort of scenario could be anything. You know, if we're dealing with a bank a bank application, maybe we just want to test that you know uh, uh, someone hasn't paid their credit card bill or whatever, and make the application react like that, um, or sort of whatever you can imagine you can have this do, and so that's. That's sort of like the, the crux of that. And then obviously, you know, with your integration tests and stuff like that, you could have it toggle between scenarios to test different um, to test different use case paths and, and all of that. And so that's really, really neat that we we have the ability to, to do that through this. And it's 
it's it's quite simple. And if you're worried about like bundle size or anything like that, you know, you can dynamically import. You can dynamically import whatever you want to make sure there's no possible way that any of this this API mocking code uh, winds up in your production bundle. Um, but yeah, let's jump back into our slides now uh, and sort of conclude out from that. Um, so I've mentioned a couple of times already that you know the 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 API mocking uh, library that I've used here. It's not the only one. Um, there's loads and loads of other ones. A good one to look at is Mock Service Worker, um, and it's um, that's really really good. And yeah. And there's loads of other topics that I just don't have a chance to talk to to you about tonight. Each of these these bullet points plus more, you know, they are their own talk uh, in their own right. So things about feature flagging strategies. So obviously all of that code that we've just written there, um, if we whack all of that around a feature flag, we're good to go to production with that. We don't need the API to be ready yet. And we can just turn that feature flag on when the API is ready and in production. And it's sort of like it reduces you know, going on to looking at like CI CD strategies and branching strategies, it goes on to the idea that we can have shorter lived branches and we can constantly integrate our code with our main line, or, you know, our main branch in our application. And it's sort of, it lends itself really nicely to the idea that, you know, we can actually move a lot faster and we can reduce the amount of hard blocking dependencies amongst like us, each other on our teams or across teams and, and all of that. And so, just to to recap, you know, all of the things I, I've spoken about, you know, there's nothing wrong with releasing something unfinished to production. You know, I've just said that. Put it behind a feature flag, you're good to go. Um, there's nothing wrong with developing front end stuff without a working API, um, and we've seen that in action. Um, you know, just just use a, use a mock, and you know, you can actually get all the front end code done. Um, you can style it. You can make it behave the way you need it to. Um, you can use all that extra time to do whatever you want, I guess. Um, and, you know, going going fast live doesn't have to be dangerous. You know, you just have to have a, a sane strategy around it. You know, it, I know a lot of what I've said makes me sound like a bit of a cowboy, and I promise you that's not the case. Um, you know, it's just about having the right plan to be able to, to, be able to integrate your code faster. Um, nothing I've actually spoken about uh, tonight is Angular-specific. The code examples that I've used are Angular. Um, but you can apply this this line of thinking, this mantra, this mindset. You can apply it to any any sort of framework, front end or back end. Um, I've redacted the names of some other popular front end frameworks um, so that hopefully I'll be invited back to talk again. <laughs> I don't know how contraband those terms are, um, but yes. Uh, and yeah, I guess like the the biggest thing, um, if I haven't really gotten the point across yet, is that if you haven't looked at things like this and you haven't sort of thought to yourself, oh, like we don't have that in this project, you know. We don't have a way of, you know, developing the front end without a working back end, or we don't have feature flags in our project, or we we don't have like CI CD pipelines that allow us to actually integrate our code faster or, or, or fast at all. You know, these are the things that I really think you should look into because it only takes a couple of small step changes within your organization. You know, you don't have to go and do all of this at once. You only need to do a couple of a, cu a couple of small things and it just adds up and up and all of a sudden you've got yourself a really healthy development experience and, and, and development environment um, that, that has the ability to move fast if you need it to um, and you know I've said I've said a few times tonight as well as you know if you want to chat about these things please just hit me up like I'm always available to sort of you know give advice or, or, or listen to to what you have to say about it um, but that's that's basically it um, there's a few helpful links here. Um, I'll spam them out on Twitter as well. Um, my code's available on GitHub. Um, there's a really, really good blog post um, written by my works um, engineering blog about branching strategies. Um, the library that I used tonight, um, mock service worker, which I really think you should check out. Um, and yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's basically it. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Hopefully, you're all still awake. Hopefully, you're all keen to try this out. Um, and it'd be really, really good to to, to see what everyone has to, to say about it. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Um, I meant to mention at the beginning, actually, I remembered from your Angular Connect talk that you were a very excellent live coder. Um, 
<laughs> and, uh, that's that's a skill that not many people have, and it's quite terrifying to most of us. So um, uh, kudos to you there. Um, and I was I was just going to yeah. say at the beginning, it's like oh, I hope you can do some more live coding because I really enjoyed that Angular Connect. So you you've made my day. <laughs> it's just you hope you 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 really pray that nothing is going to go wrong. <laughs> and inevitably, it usually does. So, uh, but um, I guess the more you do it, the more you get on top of it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've we got to have another whole talk as well about Dave's thoughts generally. I quite like that idea. <laughs> Fireside <laughs> chat to talk about <laughs> potentially uh, outrageous ideas that people may or may not choose to follow. Yeah, it definitely sounds good. So we do have a few questions. Um, obviously, Pete um, put some in because he, he likes doing that. But I'm actually not going to start with Pete today, which he'll be slightly disappointed. But um, David um, asked a question. Should a mocking strategy be worked out between front end and back end? Oh, I can't even read it. Back end and front end developers before diving in. Um, that's a that's a pretty good question, actually. Um, I guess like the short answer to that is, yeah, you, you should definitely sort of make each other aware of what's going on and how you develop your your projects. But I think um, I think in in practice, I, I guess it depends sort of like what the relationship is. Like, do you, is your team like full of front end only people, like front end only specialists, and there's another team that handles all the back end stuff, or do you have like self sufficient teams where the front end and back end is uh, are all within the, the same team. And I think that, I, I guess that may, inside is sort of screaming out, being like, well, you, you can probably set up like a mock API layer on the front end without ever having to tell the back end people um, about that. As long as, you know, you're regularly integrating and, you, you know, you've got good integration tests running and stuff like that, and you have a way of testing, making sure that you have a way of actually testing the full integration of the front end application code with the back end, so, you know, you can't only you know you can't only rely on mocks all the way up until production. Otherwise, you're going to run. And I, I have seen. I think there's some questions about this. Otherwise, you are going to run into the 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 possibility of having a mock being out of sync with what is actually being responded to from the API. So, yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Leading into to Pete's question. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, David. Um. I definitely think that communication is good there. So I, I would just be communicating that out anyway. But I don't think it's a hard requirement, you know, as long as you have a good way of testing the integration regularly with the API layer. Um, and then Pete's question about keeping the mocks between the API layer and uh, and your, your your mocks. Sorry, keeping the mocks bet between the mocks and the API layer in sync. Um, that's a really tricky one. So that does require... Uh, for the most part, a bit of strategy. And so there are tools out there that can sort of do some clever stuff. Um, you know, you've got you've got tools and, or, or you could just write, yeah, so you could write a tool um, that, that consumes your swagger and spits out um, types, and then you could use those types to, uh, to, to um, types, type guard your, your mocks. That's absolutely, there's, and there's quite a few of those tools popping up at the moment. I've Completely forgotten the name of the one that um, the, there's one in particular that's quite popular. The name sort of fallen out my head, but I can um, I can reach out to you and, and and hit you up on Twitter or, or email if you if you want me to. Great. So we got through a few questions there. Um, there's another oh, actually, one. Just sorry, I just, so just remember one thing on the whole generating mocks and swagger definitions. It's yeah. also important to keep in mind that swagger is just a really like I was about to say simple, but it's not. Is swag with your swagger specifications. There is, you know, if you wanted to just write your own tooling to generate your own mock files from a swag, swagger definition, that's also in the grand scheme of things quite easy to do. You can you can ingest uh, like swagger YAML like very easily and spit out. You know, you can interrogate um, that yourself. So if you if you weren't happy with the tooling that is available, it's actually it, it's much easier than you think it is to, to write tooling to do that for you as well, to make it do exactly what you want. Yeah, I was going to ask, in terms of those objects you're passing back, they can be dynamic as well, or do they need to be static there? No, they can be They can be dynamic, yeah. Um, I just kept it simple for, for, for the live coding exercise. But there's, um, there, in fact, there, there is uh, like mock service worker, for example, I think off the top of my head that like, by default, it's dynamic. Like you have like a, 
instead of just have it, having the ability to just supply an object, like by default, you have to supply a function that will, even if that function just returns something static, you've still got to provide a callback function. Um, so you could do whatever dynamic stuff you want in there that you want. Cool. Yeah, because I was wondering to myself how sometimes you get really complex scenarios where you need multiple interactions and the same endpoint might return different things at different points during the scenario. Um, have you ever, is that something that this supports or is that something that you have uh, thoughts about? So I think um, Datamox itself probably doesn't quite support that for the sort of full extent of, um, of that thing, um, of what you're describing. However, there are other things like, uh, once again, Mock Service Worker can, can support what you're talking about. There's also a fork of Datamox called Datamox Server. Um, and that is basically Datamox, except instead of intercepting HTTP requests, um, it spins up like an actual, like, an actual node service um, and you just feed it the mocks from there. But you can, you can program that to on top of that to do whatever you want it to do. And it also gives you, and that's one feature that I haven't gotten around to stealing or borrowing inspiration of. I know the guy that, that wrote it, so I'll, I'll use the term stealing, but only, only in a friendly way. Um, uh, it has uh, the ability to merge scenarios as well to sort of say, hey, I want to pluck a set of responses from this scenario and I want to pluck a set of responses from this scenario and I want you to all sort of bring it all together. So, you, so instead of having to like, you know, it's just sort of like the idea of reusability. It's like, well, you know, I've got this, you know, for a bank application, it might be, you know, I've got this scenario which, you know, simulates the customer has five accounts and two of them are in credit and three of them are in debt. And then I've also got this other scenario, which um, is that one of the accounts is, you know, the, the the debit card attached to it is, you know, about to expire. And so, you know, you can sort of merge those things rather than have to like write an entire different scenario, which is just the, you know, it's just sort of trying to avoid repeating yourself. I was wondering about that with the overrides, because you obviously can override the default. Um, scenario can you actually do like a hierarchy so you could have like one custom scenario overriding another one which overrides another one um i so you could tweak I it as think you went that's, yeah that's a that's a that's a cool idea actually I've, that's essentially the first time i've heard that um i don't think that datamox supports that specifically um i'm actually not too sure um what the sort of level of support for that is or whether it makes sense in i guess the the paradigms of other libraries that do this. Um, I can see that there's a question up there at the moment um, about um, alternatives. So I think I've mentioned, you know, data mock server. I've mentioned um, uh, mock mock service worker. Uh, another really interesting one, um, and it's probably technically the most popular one, uh, is JSON server. And so that. It's funny because it's simple, really, really simple in some ways, and really, really complex in other ways. Um, but that that is the the configurability and the amount of like yeah the amount of configuration options in JSON server is insane. Like it's the README is sort of oh yeah it, if you needed some some reading material before going to bed you know that's the sort of stuff that you'd want beside your bed. But um, it's it's really really cool um, just how like deep and sophisticated the stuff that you can do with that is. Um, so definitely you know give give those sorts of things a. Uh, give those sorts of things a, a look into. I definitely encourage it. Do these um, support uh, server-side rendering? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it does. Um, I, I've only tested that out a little bit. Um, the whole idea of these API mocking layers, though, the whole idea of that absolutely is supported by, um, by server-side rendering. So I saw, um, yeah, I saw on Twitter, I think, that you've just <laughs> recently started supporting GraphQL. So I was interested in, in what that meant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a GraphQL API, I probably should have mentioned this in the talk, to be honest. Um, you know, the, and all of these things that I've mentioned tonight as well support this. But, um, you know, if you've got a GraphQL API layer as opposed to a traditional REST API, um, it supports that as well. Um, there's just a slightly different way of saying, because I think by default it's assumed that you're using REST, so you just need there's just a like a type that you add to your your mock to be like, hey, this is GraphQL, and then you know you can you can specify you know whether it's a query or a mutation, 
um, and then what the responses for that look like. Sweet. It's definitely, it's definitely the cool thing that lots of people are using for the back end these days, isn't it? Yeah. So I think that's probably come to the end of most of the questions that we had. Um, I think so, yeah. What we normally do now is uh, we're going to jump over to a quick Zoom call. Uh, so uh, anyone who's on live at the moment can join us on that Zoom call and, and chat with Dave directly and Josh even if you want to as well and me. Um, <laughs> Don't forget that uh, we're always looking for people to come uh, give us a talk. Um, you don't have to do an amazing job like Dave. You could do a very good job instead, and we'd still be very happy <laughs> to have you on. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not sure if there's anything else we need to announce before we head off, Josh. No, the only thing I was going to say is uh, there have been a few people that have uh, been reaching out to us, uh, both on the uh, looking for a job and... Um, looking for people to fill jobs so um feel free to use um the meetup uh post board to advertise jobs you might have or look there if you're looking for a job uh like dave said they're also looking for people at the moment so definitely uh, contact us if you're looking for uh, some work and we'll try and uh direct you in the right way brilliant so um thanks again dave for that talk um really enjoyed listening to it and uh, I'm looking forward to watching your next live coding event. <laughs> I think there might be a series, Dave. There might be a few of these other things we might want to get you back to uh, yeah. go through. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, I find the live coding side of things keeps people interested, I, I think, because otherwise I, I can't even stand the sound, sound the sound of my own voice for that long. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much again. Cool. So cool. see you Thanks all over Zoom me. in a few moments. Bye. Bye. Cheers, everyone.